So the third uh, and final part of this unit um, is going to be talking about how you could read tabulated numerical data. So although the CSV module is handy, um, actually we deal with, um, in many cases, just simply big tables of numbers. And we want to be able to go and process those big tables of numbers in a kind of efficient and clean sort of way. And as well as being able to know that just numbers, you, the other thing you, you, you probably want to go and do is treat these as arrays of numbers rather than lists of numbers. Generally speaking, you want to avoid creating big long Python lists of lots of different numbers because it's incredibly slow and inefficient. If at all possible, you want to go straight away and create an array of data. We'll talk in the NumPy uh, video tutorials about why that's so important. Um, so the NumPy module contains several functions, in fact, which you can use to go and read um, data files, which contain tables of numbers and so on. Um, but uh, generally speaking, the gen from txt function is the most flexible and the mo um, uh, way of doing it and covers most of the things that the other functions do. So if you're only going to learn one of those functions, learn from gen from txt. So um, gen from txt um, is basically a Swiss army knife of a function. Uh, so if you look at the documentation, it's got many, many, many different options. Um, and really the, the challenge with it is working out how to use those options correctly to go and read any particular data file that you have. Um, it is, however, incredibly flexible and there are really not that many data files which you can't read somehow with it. Um, and so it does become, a, a, as I say, it's the Swiss army knife of, of file reading functions for NumPy. So kind of most straightforward use would look something a bit like this. So we're just importing NumPy as NP. Um, so we have those functions available. And then we do NP John, gen from txt, the name of the file. And then in this case, I'm having to tell it what the limiter in my file is going to be. So uh, if you give N gen from txt a string as its first argument, it assumes that that's the name of a file that you want to open. Uh, and so it will go away and try and treat that as though it's the name, the name of a file. Um, that might mean you have to go and include um, giving it a, the name of directories or folders where it is. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit um, in one of the future units about, um, probably in, in the fourth unit, about um, uh, some of the routines you can use to go and uh, manipulate um, the file system uh, in, from within Python. Um, and then by default, gen from txt will assume that a space, a tab, or some combination of spaces and tabs is the thing that marks the um, separation between the col columns. And so because in this particular case, my data file is a, a CSV file, I'm going to tell it it's got a comma instead. And then we see um, after that, we ask it, well, what have you read in? It tells us it's read 101 rows and three columns of data. Um, so that's all sounds all OK. Um, there's a slight um, twist to this, and that is that if gen from txt can't work out how to convert something to a number, it will go and return the special not a number value or nan. Um, and if you end up with nans in your data, this is basically a sign that gen from txt didn't understand how to convert your data um, or how to read your data. So one really common example is that the delimiter is set wrong. Um, so either you've specified a delimiter when you shouldn't have done, or you've specified the wrong delimiter, or you didn't specify a delimiter when you should have specified the delimiter. Um, so that's often, uh, if you just end up with lots and lots and lots of not a numbers, that's probably what's going wrong. Um, so it's a good idea to go and check whether you end up with some not a numbers in your data. Um, so to go and do that, you do something like this. Um, so reading this kind of from the inside, the np.isNan is a, a function that's going to take in an array and it's going to return true or false for every element in that array, depending whether it is or is not a not a number value. So again, remember that not a number is a special, it's a special number. So in the, the standard they use to represent floating point numbers in computing, there are three special numbers. There's NAN for not a number, there's minus infinity and there's plus infinity. Um, uh, and those take values which are distinct from uh, the other range of numbers. So I'm asking it here to go and check every single element of that data array and say, is it not a number? Uh, and then uh, that would give me 101 by three 
true or false, and now I just want to know is, well, are any of them true? So I use np.any, which then says, well, if any of the, the values were true, then return true, which is what it does. So that's telling us we had some not a number values. And in this particular case, it turns out that it's the first row. And that's because our file had a set of column headers and the column headers couldn't be converted to numbers. So probably what we want to go and do is skip over that column header. And so you can pass Jenna from TXT the skip header uh, parameter, um, keyword parameter, um, and get it to skip over that first row. And so our Jenna from TXT will be better looking like this. And now when we print out that shape, we can see that it's 100 by three. Um, so 100 rows by three columns, because we skipped the first one. And now there are no not a numbers in there at all, which is good. Jenkins TXT can do a whole bunch more things. And so just to give you a flavor of some of the things you can do. Um, so if you've got a, a big data file with lots and lots of columns in it, and again, in unit one, I showed you some data file formats that we get in our lab where we have 30, 40, 50 columns. Um, you probably don't want to have to deal with 30, 40 or 50 columns. And so you can use um, uh, the use calls parameter, um, keyword parameter to, to select out exactly which columns you want. So it just looks like this. It's the same line as before, but this time we we're passing it use calls. And now we're asking it for the second and third columns, remembering that we Python, we count from zero. So the first column was column zero, second column is column one, and the third column is column two. And so you can see that data now has a shape of 100 rows by two columns. Um, another thing, again, uh, in reality, if you're working with columns of data, you probably want to get each column into a separate variable so you can work with it more conveniently. So you could quite easily do something like this. So we read in the, the data with the Jenna from TXT. Data is a two-dimensional table of array of data. Uh, and then we want to slice out each column separately. Um, and so again, the, the syntax for doing this is covered in the NumPy topic videos, but this will produce three columns of data uh, for the first, second, and third columns of data. But it's a bit inconvenient. Um, Jen from TXT gives us a handy uh, unpack keyword parameter, which we can use. And that lets us do everything in one line uh, rather than four lines. Um, and so what it does is it makes the data be transposed from, instead of being 100 rows by three columns, it turns it into three rows of 100 columns, which then lets us uh, assign it to three different variables in one go. Um, and so we're able to pull out uh, column one, column two, and column three. And then we just want to go and prove that, um, that doing those are equivalent operations. Uh, and so here I've just asked it to go and is C1 the same as col1. Um, now doing that test is going to produce a hundred trues and falses, hopefully a hundred trues. And so I just say, are they all true with the np.all function? And it says, yes, they're all, they're all true. So that's read out um, that, that the, doing those two operations, either reading as a two-dimensional data and then individually pulling out the indexing to pull out the columns I want, or simply using the unwrap, uh, both do the same thing. So um, the other thing you might face is if your data file uh, has some missing values in it, you need to go and handle those specially. So for example, what you often find is a, an instrument might, if it fails to take a reading, because I don't know, it may be auto ranging or it just decided that that didn't like that reading for some reason, it'll produce something in your data file that says there's a missing reading here. So for example, it might just produce a dash, meaning that reading is missing or an asterisk or something like that. Um, and when you read that in, um, you don't really necessarily want that to become an, N an NAN value. You might want to do something else with it, have it be some other value um, in your data set. So uh, you can go and tell Jen from TXT to go and deal with that by using the missing values keyword parameter, say, this is what a missing value is going to look like in your data file. And then a filling values to say, this is what I want you to actually put in the output data array when you see a missing value. Um, and you can simply use it something like this. So we give it the missing values, these, um, in this case, our dash, 
And in this example, I've said, let's um, replace that, that filling value with a, a zero instead. Um, and so it just simply goes off and reads the data file um, and replaces all of the, the missing values with zeros. So again, um, Jenna from TXT can do lots of things for you. It's incredibly flexible um, and very, very powerful way of reading your data in um, if it's just big tables of numbers. So although it's that really, really powerful thing, it's not magic. Um, and there are situations that it gets a bit stuck on. So uh, one, for example, is if your column headers have delimiter characters in, because unlike the CSV module, it doesn't really understand how to deal with quoting things. Um, so that's one way in which it can fall over. Um, also, it um, can't handle binary data. So if you have binary data, um, for example, in the case of Excel files, .xlsx data um, uh, or um, image data, then you're going to need to use something else. And uh, we'll look in unit five at um, some of the other libraries that are out there that um, if you end up having to go and do this in, a, a, in another year, um, that you might need to go and be using. Um, the other thing that we've only done so far is look at data where the actual data is all just tabulated, rather than including, as we saw in unit one, a mixture of metadata and then numerical tabulated data as well. Um, now you can, of course, with Jenna from TXT, just skip over any lines of metadata if you can work out how many there are to skip over. And again, we'll, we'll show how to do that in the next unit. Uh, but of course, actually, probably what you want to go and do is read that metadata as well, because often that's telling you useful and important things that you need to know about the experiment or the, the data file or the simulation or whatever it is you're reading. Um, so in the next unit, we'll focus on the next level of complexity, which is dealing with uh, metadata and data in the same file at the same time. <laughs>